And then Cliff, if you do get that email and I don't, can you forward it to me so that I can upload it and do all that sort of stuff? That sure. I will. Do? Sure. Will. Awesome. All right, so I want to point out this uh, section that I'm highlighting right here, and that is uh, questions that you'd like us to address at the lab. These don't have to be questions that you are like, oh, I really need to know the answer to that. They can be questions of. Um, oh, this is the thing that we should talk about when we talk about this, because somebody here might need to talk about that, or it's just part of a conversation that we should be having um, that we haven't included so far. So rather than just let it miss out, um, let's introduce it. So put those questions or those issues. I don't like that it says obstacle here. I'm going to say idea. There we go. Things that we should talk about on that right hand left hand column. And then because active teaching labs are participatory. We rely on you all to jump in. Um, I fully recognize that I am not an expert in all sorts of things. There are things I know, right? But there are situations, especially in teaching environments across campus, there's so many different types of teaching and learning environments. <clears throat> and I've not been in those, um, but you have been in your teaching and learning environment, so you have experiences that you could share with me and with the others on the call here um, so that we know these things. Um, sometimes I'm able to share like second or third hand stories, but it's better to hear those um, directly from you all. So in that second column, if you've got an answer to something or an idea about it, please add it in there. I'll also point out that um, if you have ideas that aren't shared, we've got the section on the bottom called other resources. So if you're like, oh, there's a great reading or article that I've seen on this or created on this, um, please put it on down there. We'll use that at the bottom of the page here. We'll use that for future um, sessions. Okay, let me make this a little bit bigger so that those who are seeing it on the screen will be able to see it. Oh, one more thing. Underneath the table, we have these um, things you can do, for example, to foster and uh, encourage affinity spaces. And I've got a couple of ideas here that I've put in, um, but I don't know all the answers again. If you have an easy thing to do or something that takes a little bit more work, um, or something that took a lot of work or something that you're trying to find out an answer to, um, add it in that easy, medium, or challenging spaces below these, and you'll see these for all of our different uh, topics here, right? There's the ones that I came up with, but you also have ideas, things that you've seen, things that you've heard of, uh, things that you found on the web. All right, now let's get talking about the internet. Um, some might suggest that we are already on the internet far too much. And if you look at these articles here that I've included, the internet is not the best place. I mean, there's something that we can probably agree with. I'm often sick of the internet. And if you were in school um, as an undergraduate when I was, you will recall that the only place to find inf the internet wasn't there. The only place to find information was through that very limited access that that I had to the experts that I knew about on the college campus that I attended um, or was directed to through our fabulous research librarians. But I will tell you that in doing literary criticism, there was a stack of, I don't know, a dozen very thick old books that talked about literary theory and that was, you know, that was the world of literary theory, the stuff that was published back in the day before I was born. That's no longer the case. We no longer have an absence of information about whatever the topic is, right? We have in many cases too much information. We are inundated with information and the challenge now is no longer in finding any information, but finding the right information. So it's it's critical thinking. It's when we think about Bloom's cognitive domain, it's analyzing, um, evaluating, and in order to analyze and evaluate, of course, you have to remember and understand and be able to apply. So these are higher level thinking skills that honestly, I was not as challenged in um, graduate, I'm sorry, uh, well, even undergraduate school. Um, 
in these areas because the big emphasis was on where can I even find anything? So lots of information. And that is the beautiful thing about the Internet. Again, the challenging part is lots of crappy information out there. Um, some of it is terrible, and that's sort of it's the digital literacy. It's it's helping our students learn to think critically about what information is good, what information is bad, how do we tell? That's the kind of stuff that um, is really important in the Internet. Now, should we use the Internet or should we try to avoid that? Any thoughts from anyone there on that? By the way, you're all allowed to uh, raise your hand um, or just unmute and jump in and feel free to do that. Hi, John, if I may jump Keep in. <laughs> There's no way we can avoid it. <laughs> it's well, part we of- We can as instructors, we can- Well, in every, if we want to mirror the world that we live in, uh, and even even if we don't, I don't think we live in a world where we can avoid the Internet and uh, we are well advised to shift the question from should we use it or avoid it to how do we use it in, in effective ways. I study uh, uh, communication and technology and this is a question that I get very frequently when I talk to reporters and parents. Um, they want to know if we sh should be uh, trying to avoid the Internet as much as possible. And um, the answer to that is, you know, we're, we live in a world uh, driven by technology and we're never going to have less of it. We're just going to have more of it. So the challenge is to know how to use it effectively, how to understand its nuances and its its danger zones, just like you've outlined here. And it's also its potentials for enhancing our teaching. Because if we don't use it, our students will. Um, and you know, yes, our students will, their employers will, they'll be required to know how to use it, so on and so forth. All right. And in many ways, that's the kind of stuff that I've got here with we're already using it. Um, let's just make us use it better. Um, the beautiful thing about it is it represents information in so many ways. Now we often as instructors, and I'm absolutely guilty of this, there is a way that I've designed this activity sheet and that works very well for me. Right? The Internet is full of different ways to represent all kinds of things. Um, and in some ways, I try to leave links to those things so that if you read my little short summary, you can say this one interests me, this one not so much. So I'm giving you a little bit of a choice with a little bit of an annotation about what might be at that choice. And that way I'm letting you kind of go out and, um, and play with that. But the beautiful thing is we all learn a little bit differently based on our experiences, based on our values, based on our um, skill levels, um, we often as learners speaking generally, we try to build on our existing patterns of knowing and that means that we look to the familiar and anything that new that comes in, we try to fit in with what we current our current schema, right? Our current ways of seeing and knowing the world. So the Internet is great at providing different ways to look at that knowledge. As an instructor, I might say this is the best way that works for me, so I'm going to assign you the one best reading, but it, I forget to realize that it's the one best reading for me based on my schema of the world, and it might not be the best for the other students. The Internet allows many different ways to look at that knowledge um, and supports many different um, viewpoints and perspectives. Again, some are bad, some are good, some are bad, um, but we need to figure out how to how to uh, put that to it. Um, the Internet and provided our students can access it and we'll get to access a little bit is really about empowerment and personification or uh, personalization. We are letting our students take the choice. We're letting them take some res more responsibility for their learning. So it's not up to us as an instructor to push and pull and force and coerce and lure and you know all of that stuff for learning. Let's just say, OK, most of our students are adults, right? In that 18 and older level in college. Um, and even if we get a 17 or 16 year old, they're basically adults and they can do this as well. Let's empower them to take some of that responsibility. Um, to have some of that freedom to learn the way that they want to learn. Uh, we've got a link to the affective domain, another element of uh, Bloom and uh, Kratwal. Uh, they talk about do we value learning? 
So the cognitive domain many of us are very familiar with, that's remember, understand, uh, apply, uh, analyze, evaluate all the way on. And the affective domain is about, am I just passively listening or am I um, starting to answer, respond, starting to answer questions? Do I value it? Things like that. Um, the more that we can get our students to take on that level of commitment, the easier our job becomes for us and for the rest of the students. And we'll talk about that in just a minute as well. We already talked about critical evaluation. Inspiration is an element that I, I'd like to jump in because the Internet is not about what happens between you as an instructor and the instructor and the student, right? Oftentimes our assignments are give me an assignment. I'm going to be the only one who reads that assignment, right? It's just going to be like write me a paper. Nobody else is going to see that paper. The Internet is not about only one person reading a thing, right? So our Internet assignments can be things like. Go find me a list, but find that list and share it with the rest of the class. So what works for you might work for other students in the class. Um, and there's a recognition there that as the instructor, I don't know the best way to. Uh, represent things for you or the rest of the class. And there's really a good chance that. Whether it's because I'm an expert, whether it's because I'm uh, an overtly educated white male who's like. Already dedicated his life to this. Uh, the differences are, you know, the differences are huge. Maybe some other learners at your students levels can say this is how I understand it. This is why I value it. Here's an example and they can inspire each other more than we can. Transfer is sort of the golden standard or the golden, the holy grail of learning. Um, and oftentimes the things that we do in the classroom, they are not authentic situations, right? They can't be because they're sterile and it's in a learning environment, all that sort of stuff. But there are examples on the Internet of real authentic work that um, that one can see uh, where one can see. Our. Course content applied. And then there's a great thing about. Um, the participation participatory nature of it, just like this lab. All right, so that's that's the why why engage and then there's the ways and I'm not going to talk about these right now in detail. I'm just going to sort of leave them here for you because I'd like to get into that participatory um, element where I start getting ideas from you all. We've got some things to avoid and. Um, in addition to constraining choice. Unsupported tools. This is kind of a big one and, and there's an element of equity here. Um, give them choice, but don't say you must use. So don't say you must use this tool because. Do they have to have a Netflix account in order to uh, to watch that movie that you want them to watch? Do they have to? Um, sign up for a service and log in. Um, in order to participate that gets into shady gray area where now you're saying, hey students, I expect you to. Exp expose yourself to the Internet is not the right phrase that I'm using here, but expose your data and information about yourself to things that have not been vetted by campus. So be careful again. We can treat them as adults and say if you'd like to do something, I just need you to bring back a screenshot or an essay or a link to it. Um, but it gets a little bit trickier when we say um, this is the tool that I want you to use. All right. And then busy work. That's all about authenticity. All right, I'm going to. Um, take a break now from speaking and I would like to invite um, anyone else on the call right now to raise your hand or unmute and jump in. Give me some responses. Tell me what I forgot. Tell the rest of us uh, what I forgot. Um, bring up some good points that you'd like to bring up. Again, I'll invite you also to um, share your idea in the table on the bottom of uh, page two of our activity sheet here. OK, and I'll shut up. Um, something that I always think is a good thing to mention to students or if you're using the Internet as a tool, like it's a great tool, but if you're asking them to use it to find like use it as a resource to remind students 
the validity, validity of that resource. So if you're asking them to look up five different websites for a definition of something new, you know, you could ask them find different five different websites that have a definition of this, list them here, pick out your favorite one. What what did you like about that website? But if they're finding webs, there's tons of websites out there, right? So are we looking for EDUs? Are we looking for like reminding students how to find good information on the internet, right? It's always a good thing to remind them of. Yeah, thank you, Lisa, and, and welcome. And uh, Haley, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so sorry, I was just about to put my hand down because it doesn't directly relate to that good comment, but uh, as, as something to avoid, um, you know, when I think of an internet assignment, I think, oh, the possibilities, you know, it's almost overwhelming. Um, so maybe something to avoid kind of the corollary to constraining choice could be, you know, keeping it simple um, or, you know, watching out for complexity in your assignment. Yeah, absolutely. And like one really good way to do that, um, again, students, anytime that you assign them anything, the first thing they think is what do they want? What do they, what do my, what do my, what does my instructor want from me? What is the, and, and like they want the one example that they can replicate. And if you give them one example, one model, then they will, you know, seven times out of 10, they will just duplicate that and they will replace, you know, your points for their points. And it'll be, it'll look very much like your thing, uh, the, the model that you gave them. When we do give them models, um, give them a variety of models that, that succeed and give them some models that that don't succeed, right? So that they get to learn what that problem space looks like. And if I'm given three models that are different that fulfill the assignment, now I, I can't say, well, this one's, uh, this is the one that the teacher wants the most. I can say, this is the one of the three that works best for me. Or I can say, you know, I wanna do this fourth thing and it has the elements of the second and uh, some of the elements of the first and you know maybe a few elements of the third, so I think I can make the case that it works. It signals to the students that there is no one right answer for the way that they should learn or the materials that they should get. If you don't give them anything, you're absolutely right. It, it can be overwhelming. The internet is huge and I can just go to any page. Oh, is this can be all right and I'll be nervous uh, about that as well. Yeah. All right, Leah and then um, Jules, I'm sorry. And if you wanted to respond to that, that'd be great too. Hi, um, and Julie, thank you for the librarian shout out. Um, so I am a librarian and um, something that I notice a lot in classes um, that I'm teaching, you know, teaching students how to do research um, is there's a balance between um, respecting that students are on the Internet a lot and they uh, think that they know how to use the Internet and um, realizing that they don't maybe know how to use the internet for research and they don't know how to use databases um, like they're meant to be used or library resources at all um, and so i just wanted to throw that out that that's something i notice a lot and i think it's a delicate balance um, of, of when you're talking about using the internet um, in the classroom and that's that's great what we think we know about our, our our internet use is generally limited to our daily practices right so if I feel I'm really good at the internet, that's because I'm really good at using the internet to do the things that I use the internet for, right? And I might be really good at that. I might be the top of my field in that one little thing that I use. Um, but to your point, there's a lot of information out there. There are good ways and bad ways uh, to use it and relying on our librarians um, and to show us models of, of doing it well is, is fantastic. All right, Jules, jump in. Yeah, um, so piggybacking on what Leah just shared and and Heidi's comment as well. Um, so I also am a librarian on campus and when I um, teach students, I often ask them to provide the criteria that they use when evaluating sources. Um, and what I found is students are sometimes overconfident in their ability to um, evaluate sources and many times the criteria that they're using to evaluate sources are pretty surface level. So um, there've been a lot of articles recently and I can share one in the chat in a moment 
about teaching students to read laterally, um, to evaluate sources more like fact checkers. Um, and so what I'll, I'll do is ask students to list, um, you know, how they evaluate a source and um, then I'll try to challenge those. So they'll say, well, if it ends in .edu, it's a good source. Or if it comes from, you know, the library, a library database, then it's a good source. And so I'll challenge them and ask. Um, so are all the books in the libraries good sources? No, no bad books in the libraries? Um, are all the articles that you find in a library database reliable or academic or scholarly? Um, and so I try to show them that no matter where they're finding their sources, um, even though it's more likely they'll find um, scholarly and reliable sources through the library's databases, that they still need to use these criteria. Um, and in terms of evaluating websites, um, this is an example that's uh, kind of fun that I can pull out um, in the moment when I'm teaching about um, the Pacific Northwest tree octopus. So it's a website that is intentionally built to um, pass all of those standard criteria for evaluating websites, but of course is completely made up. So um, I'll share that uh, research about teaching students to read laterally later in the chat. I didn't know about the tree octopi. That's amazing. Really good point. And yes, in grade school and high school curriculum about trusting internet resources, does it end in .edu? That, and then it's a trustworthy source. These are the simple superficial levels that we learn. Um, what's the difference between good and bad? Is it .com? Bad, right? Right, right. So then I point out like EBSCO.com is how all of the library's articles show up. So technically not an EDU address. But yeah, providing opportunities for them to confront those misconceptions, um, especially when it's directly applied to an assignment is super helpful. Great. Um, any other thoughts on that before we start moving on? I love that you have that you started off with a conversation. And again, this is a great way to shift some of the responsibility of do as I say for learning into think about what you what do you want to do? What are the you know moving it from instructor led to student centered? Um, having the students come up with a criteria, having them come up with what's good and even even do that reflection on what's good and what's bad. Can you show us examples of what's good and what's bad? Um, down below, I had, uh, well, in the second one with resources below, I talk about student curation. And I think, you know, oftentimes when one first thinks about student curation, we think about really good stuff, right? Share some excellent sources on X, Y, or Z. I think, you know, a good assignment could also be share some really terrible sources on X, Y, or Z, because we can learn just as much from that um, tree octopus article about what's good and bad by seeing some bad examples as as we can if we see only the good examples. Um, and I talk about this regularly. If we're going to be in a problem space where we're learning about something, we need to know what success looks for granted, but we also need to know what failure looks like. Because and if we're not familiar with sort of that range, then we might. If we ever run into a failure or a, a bad website, bad information, we might not be able to recognize it. So having that experience with failure, that experience with terrible resources, that's that we put that into our, 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 our brain and our patterns and we say this is what bad looks like. This is what good looks like in this context, etc. Excellent. All right, I see that we have some um, questions or ideas that we should talk about here. Um, again, I'd like to we only have two and we've got half an hour left, so please jump in with more things that we talk about as well. Um, but let's start off with the first one here, unless there's somebody else who has something to say. Thoughts and ideas? All right. John, can you make it larger, the image? I make the image larger. Let me mess around um, with this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, does that work? Yes, yes. You can keep this them. is this is kind of a fun um, thing that I've been playing around with with um, remote instruction and participation. 
I've got this Google Doc at 200% um, al already, but I notice that it also has to fit sort of the shape of the um, of the space of your laptop or whatever device that you're looking at. And so I often think that um, I will have a, a laptop open here as well so that I can see what it is that I'm looking at because in teams like Zoom and some of the other things, I don't actually see what I'm showing or it doesn't show up because I'm looking at it on a big screen. Um, so having that second laptop helps me make those adjustments. Thank you for asking for it though, because that's that's the kind of feedback that we need um, in order to, to do a better job uh, at presenting things. Um, and I also encourage folks to open up the um, activity sheet on their own on their own tab. And then if you have, especially if you have a big enough monitor, um, having them side by side or just hiding me and putting me behind um, and just following along on that and listening to us, that works as well. All right, so what apps or tools do your students use to temporarily block their social media uh, while they're working online to prevent distraction? Oh, for that level of self-regulation, right? If only they would block their distraction um, from all of the things that are really important to them the other uh, 23 hours of the day uh, that, and put it aside for that hour that they're with you. Um, Anybody have ideas on that? <clears throat> have you had these conversations with students about here are some ways or app blockers or um, social media pop up blockers, notification blockers um, that you can use so that you don't get that ping, that very addictive, uh, lovely ping that we you know live on um, and, and feed off of uh, in social media? Any ideas, any thoughts on that? I don't have any. Hi, John, Hi. it's Heidi, and I've had a number of students comment that they do use these apps and they'll turn them, they'll enable them for an hour. It will help them focus and avoid distractions. And I just, I've forgotten what they used. I've asked them about it. I've written it down. I haven't taken notes on that. I've tried to Google these things, but you know, I'd, I, maybe what I need to do is just survey them again and and see what they use, but they, uh, I've, they've reported that it's really helped them to use these types of apps. So one of the things that I was involved in last spring before the pandemic happened was um, leveraging technology to learn. And our idea there was to um, start talking to students and having students share with other students their strategies. So we started off, for example, talking to seniors um, as they were like, they saw April or May in, in the, the, the the light at the end of the tunnel became really large and we said, what would you have told knowing what you know now? What advice would you give to your first year self? And it was fantastic because time management and distraction study habits. No surprise maybe to us, but surprising to them um, or first year students. These are the big things that come up. We come in as uh, first year students and we think that we know what happened or what to do well because we came from a, a K-12 setting that was very structured that had these sort of routines and patterns, but now we're in college and things are different and we have to learn all of this all over again because we don't have our parents setting us down in the, uh, the, the kitchen table saying you must do your homework, right? That self-empowerment kicks in and all of a sudden now we are responsible for our learning, but we're not ready. And so our first year students, they didn't know enough about time management and our seniors um, and last year, you know, as they're on their way out, they learn, they've learned often through lots of mistakes, uh, the hard knocks and, you know, all sorts of terrible things that we don't wish on people, um, how to sort of get better at these things. And our, and our thought is, how can we get our seniors to talk to our freshmen, our, our first year students? How can we get our first year students to talk to each other, to listen to the sophomores, the juniors, et cetera, as they, um, as they figure these things out? Can we shorten that learning experience and make it a little bit less painful, make the mistakes or the, the stakes for failing um, by not having good time management, by not having good uh, strategies for avoiding distractions, et cetera? Um, easier, better. 
and go ahead, Lisa, you've got ideas. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you kind of covered it, which is maybe not even looking at apps, but more of a strategy. So I think it depends on what kind of devices our students are using. But, you know, if you're on a computer, maybe the rule you have is you don't open up any of that on your computer, but it's all on your phone and you leave your phone in a different room or you put it in the drawer for an hour so that you're not even it's not even popping up on the device that you're on. Um, would be my strategy instead of looking for an app to solve my problem, just do some physical type um, strategies of like separating myself from that distraction um, by separating what's on my device that I'm at currently working on. Yeah, the Pomodoro, I hope I'm saying that right, I might not be, um, technique I know where they have 25 minutes of uninterrupted um, focus on a task. I know that there are timers out there, uh, Chrome extensions, individual timers for your phone, for your app, um, et cetera. Um, and I know that a lot of our students have discovered these and are working on that. Um, to your point, even without an app, um, we can start to structure that into our lives by, for example, leaving our phone in our uh, residence hall room, for example, and then going to another place to study, right? Now we still have the computer, which can may or may not um, pop up notifications, but maybe we can say the, the computer is not where I do this. The phone is where I do this and we structure our lives in that way. Um, good. Any other thoughts on this before we move on to the next one? That's a big one and I think that the, the theme that that question uncovers is uh, again about self-regulation, right? And it's a tricky one like the Internet. We're asking them to go out into the wild, into this place that is full of cat videos, full of distractions, full of Reddit threads on the things that they are most interested in. And we're saying, ignore all that stuff that's that's all scattered throughout that landscape and focus on um, the assignment that we're giving you to do. So it gets it gets tricky to help them figure out how to navigate that space. Really, really good thoughts. All right. The next thought then is providing models is great, but variety is best. A variety of, of models is best, so students don't replicate a single model in an attempt to produce as desired. Um, this would help them identify commonalities and synthesize the core ID pieces of your models. Excellent point. Um, again, um, if you can give them, here are some of the things that our students did in the past, and you with permission from previous students um, are able to share those, you know, two or three very different models um, that does sort of give a, an array of things that they can take pieces from rather than, um, as the commenter said here, uh, replicate very at a detailed level. Good. All right. Welcome, Peter. I'm going to put the invitation to jump into the activity sheet here. And we're on the second thing. All right, and then somebody else has already indicated here, helpful to provide authentic student models. Just what I said, excellent. I love having you all here, jumping in and contributing in this way because then I don't have to do all that typing because I can't type and talk at the same time. Peer review is another one. Um, it's another teaching practice that lets students at least expose them to different ways of doing things than what they did. And oftentimes if you if I do a paper and it's just my paper and I don't see anybody else's paper, I'll do it the way that I do it. And you know, I think it's good because it looks good compared to the other things that I've done, but I don't really know where my level is at. Um, I don't have a, a deep understanding of that. Even if I get feedback and even if I get very detailed feedback from the instructor, and let's be honest, in a larger class, instructors cannot, they don't have the time or ability to give detailed feedback um, to all of their students at the same time, right? So if we can get at least some exposure to other students' um, thoughts, thought processes, ways of looking at the pro at the um, at the topic or concept that we're working on, that gives them something to compare their work against, right? It's an opportunity for some level of self-check. Now, if the one example is also terrible, 
then that self check level is not so good. But if they have two or three different ones that they can see, the chances of them having a higher level uh, bar to reach is is better. So yeah, peer reviews another one as well, and that curation not just curating for you the instructor, but curating for other students in the class that can help them inspire that help inspire them, help them see representations of uh, a diversity of viewpoints and um, identities represented in your discipline. And I think that that's really important from a race and equity um, uh, element as well. All right, it's a very short, sweet phrase uh, on this one. Let's uh, look at Canvas assignment and assessment strategies. And I would love to invite uh, whoever put that there to um, expand on that a little bit more uh, because so peer review, and I'm going to keep talking until you uh, until you do, or or maybe type something else in there, add something in chat, uh, something to give me a little bit more thoughts. But like peer review is a good idea, uh, way to do that in Canvas specifically. Um, even the discussion forum, instead of being post once and comment twice, turn that into a share one example of the concept as uh, as you see it, and it might be. Share a good example. It might be share a bad example. Of course, with the share a bad example, explain why it's a bad example. Good for a sure good example too, right? Here's a good example of what we're talking about, and here's what I recognize are three things that make it a good example, or three things that make it a bad example. Um, that can be kind of fun, and happen in Canvas. Anyone else have other ideas on Canvas assignment and assessment strategies? John, this is Duncan. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I put that in there. Um, the I, yeah, my my question is yeah, how to make how to make things accessible in a way that's mm, expedient. Let's call it <laughs> given resources uh, and and get students to engage in in doing it. And usually that implies credit, and it's um, so the, this, these kinds of activities um, go hand in hand with figuring out really successful ways of, of getting students to do the work and, and good ways for doing the assessment, which are manageable for our instructors. So I'd love to hear the things people have um, tried in, in, towards whatever end they have in, in using these internet assignment. I can speak at length of things I've done, but I'm interested to hear what others have done. Um, and others are interested in hearing those things that you have done as well. Tables turned. So um, whether they work or whether they don't work um, to your to your question about um, the best ways to assess these things or to um, give rewards for the students for doing this. And I, I wonder if if there's. Um, if, if there's part of that, so I'm, I'm thinking of. Um, you know, as an example, if you have the students in a discussion, say I want you to read something and then come up with a, a, a quiz question or an exam question or a deep thought about that. Um, one way to reward that is to give them some points for doing that, right? Um, but you could also do that built into a reflection question in any of your activities, just sort of as a, a one extra thing and. With their permission, say, you know, or you can name them and say this is a really great idea that that somebody came up with. Or you could say, I saw some really good examples of great quiz questions. And even without naming them, um, the students get that sort of, oh, they're talking about me. My instructor's talking about me. And that's that's like a little pat on the back. You're doing well, unnamed student. You know who you are. Um, and that's more of an intrinsic reward than a extrinsic reward. But I think that that intrinsic rewards have their place. Intrinsic rewards also have their place when they come from the other students. So students can build up and I think Piazza does a really good job of this <coughs> potentially uh, where students build a level of cultural capital um, or social capital by saying, oh, I'm the go to person on this thing. So I can start developing a, a reputation for having some expertise around uh, X, Y or Z 
point. Um, not, you know, as humans, we like to have that like, oh, I'm the go to person for this, um, that recognition that we know something. That's an intrinsic reward that I think is, is a, a powerful motivator for students. Other people's thoughts on that? And thanks for uh, the self assessment from a given rubric. I think, yeah, rubrics is, are a really good way to. Um, and, and let's talk a little bit more about rubrics. The broader your rubric. Let's see if I can phrase this effectively. Um, rubrics really help students. Figure out what it is that the expectations are. If they're very tightly constrained, then rubrics become a checklist. Right, and students will be like, got that exactly. Two to three sources, I got two, I'm doing well. Um, but they can also be self constraining at that point because if I get full points by doing two sources, why would I do more than two sources? Um, what we can also do though is we can say share an idea versus, you know, have, have that uh, share three examples or uh, come up with four citations enough citations to support your uh, thing effectively and that way it's like I better put in one more. I better put in two more um, rather than have a, a, a specific number. It also the broader the rubric, the more the students are empowered to go out and do things that they that are not very um, uh, technique driven or very. Uh, specific measurements. Uh, it gives them a little bit more ability to um, find the things that work for them while meeting your expectations rather than focusing on meeting your expectations and putting their interests aside. If that makes sense, can somebody say that better than I did? One really good uh, technique is a teach back technique, and uh, this is used in healthcare where uh, the healthcare provider will say here are the directions for you know how many pills to take a day. And then they say to this patient, OK, um, can you tell me what you would tell your um, family member about how many pills to take a day or, or what are the directions for this? And we have the, um, the patient. Rephrase what we said. It's a very good technique. Pardon my dogs. Anybody want to be the patient here and tell me what I just said? I'm going to shut the door. Oh, I'm not hearing anything. Come on, y'all. This is participatory. Give me some ideas. All right, we'll move on. Students are sometimes overconfident about their abilities to evaluate the sources they find. And yeah, uh, Jules, you talked about that early on. Very good. Uh, and some of the discussions we said were to uh, talk to them about their criteria. Excellent. Uh, provide examples and 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 also ask the students to provide those examples. I think we talked about it as well. Uh, and then strategies for reading laterally. Oh, and this is also sort of even outside of the scope of this discussion. Canopy. Uh, dot com is pretty cool and you can access some really good movies that you might not be able to get um, on Netflix or Prime or some of these other streaming services. I have an idea. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think it's good to also just use the internet for what it is, which is a giant fun mess. So maybe incorporating some fun low stakes assignments it's, that brings the group together maybe for the day. Like everyone find a meme that represents how you feel today and post it. Um, so if you can like incorporate some low stakes 
activities that are just fun and using a resource that they all know how to use and they're quite good at it. So I think that maybe incorporating just not so serious, but just using it as what it is, which is a conglomeration of a bunch of very useful things, some ridiculous things and some bad things. Absolutely. Thank you for saying that. And I think that it's it's really important to recognize that part of a learning community is not just the serious. Let's all, you know. Stroke our beards sorry, and um, talk about academic stuff, but no, it's how do we trust each other? How do we learn to trust each other? How do we learn to? Um, understand, communicate with each other. We need these uh, low stakes. Thank you for, for saying that low stakes activities that build that community that help me recognize that these aren't a bunch of strangers that scary strangers in the room, but oh, they have a sense of humor or oh, that person's interested in the same kind of thing that I'm interested in. Um, and that builds up these relationships. Um, in video games, um, for example, uh, James G talks about affinity spaces and there's affinity groups that are used in, in race and equity um, things as well. But in this case, it's the affinity spaces. If you look at reddit.com, there are all of these subreddits, right? And the subreddits are groups of communities of practice that are interested in specific, sometimes very weird little niche elements of whatever that larger Reddit um, space is. And we can do that with our student groups as well, but we can't do that unless our students start to recognize um, in each other that they are interested in some of the same things, that they are similar in many ways um, and sometimes more similar than they are different, um, not just because they're in the class, but because of outside interests, skills, values, etc., that they bring to that community, that they bring to that cohort and can share with each other. Um, so yeah, those fun icebreakers, uh, meme sharing, gift sharing, uh, things like even in the chat system here, the ability in Teams, for example, to be able to give a thumbs up to people in the posts, that's a that's a small but significant uh, tool in building a community. And and if I'm just speaking to uh, avoid um, as a student. I'm less and I don't think that anybody's hearing me. I'm less likely to continue speaking. So I think that that social element is really important. So and Peter, you had had your hand up. Uh, any thoughts? Um, yes, I wanted to. Uh, I, sorry, I'm a little slow today, but I wanted to make <laughs> um, a plug for canopy.com. I that's one I use very lot very much because if you go into the library and you can embed the code into a page in canvas then you know it provides you um the option if if it's a video say for an hour it breaks it down into little segments and it shows you the segments on uh, the page it provides a transcript it provides everything you know that the, the udl um learning um would would facilitate and support and so I you know I think that's a, a, a resource that's um, underappreciated as far as I can tell you know and so I that's a really uh, even if you have to video yourself and upload it yourself I think you will find that it's a lot better if you can just you know direct people to the library version with their with their net ID that you have embedded on a canvas page so that that was one comment I wanted to make. Yeah, thanks. And one of the things that we talk about um, as far as uh, supported tools, like Canopy is a great example of a supported UW Medicine supported tool that you can ask them to 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 use, um, and that makes it pretty easy to use it. As Peter says, just because you can embed it directly in your Canvas course, right? Um, but there's no need to actually constrain that as well. You can also say, hey, students, go find an example um, in pop culture wherever you're off to, you know, go find a video that nobody else can possibly access. Grab a screenshot of it, 
share that screenshot as an image in, in, in a discussion or a Padlet or something like that, and then explain to us, um, and this is good for accessibility as well, what is happening on that image and why the image demonstrates the course concept, you know, a good example again or a bad example or, or whatever. Um, there are some really great examples of this on YouTube. Um, I remember some on uh, the Lion King and I forgot the anthropological uh, concept, but it, it looks at these modern movies uh, and it says, and here's an example of this happening, this concept that we talked about last week in class. Um, and it's it's kind of a it's a fun it's a fun way to sort of bring their world. And again, this is uh, to, to Lisa's point. It's a fun, chaotic mess. Bring some of that chaotic messiness into the classroom in a more discreet, more distinct, less messy way. Just taking a screenshot and explaining the screenshot or having a clip of a canopy video uh, that we focus in on uh, together. It's 1.55. If you have a uh, two o'clock appointment you need to get to, thank you for coming. We're going to stick around for another five minutes and um, eke out a conversation here. Is Teams allowed for classes yet? Um, let me tell you my experience. I know that some instructors are using Teams for class. Um, Teams is not a Learn at UW supported tool. And so the Learn at UW uh, folks would say, uh, please do not ask them about using Teams uh, because they're up to their eyeballs supporting the, the other tools. Um, my personal experience is using Teams is that this is a thing that is um, more familiar with sort of the administrative side of campus and less familiar with uh, less familiar by students so that from uh, sort of an equity or accessibility standpoint, um, it becomes one more tool for the students to have to learn. Um, so harkens back to the days of when we had some students using Moodle or having some classes in Moodle and D2L, Brightspace, um, Canvas, or um, you know even the KB or you know WordPress. The things that we can do to simplify would be better. Um, I found Teams to be, I thought it was going to be this great thing this semester uh, for Active Teaching Labs, and it's been a struggle. Um, so I'm not sure that it's ready, and that's uh, not an official uh, perspective, but it is my perspective. Um, that said, Canvas, I remember seeing a PR post both by Canvas and Microsoft saying that Teams was going to be the official video streaming platform for Canvas. I saw one in March and I saw it again in this, uh, November of 2020. Whether that means that it's going to actually come to campus is a whole other thing and requires lots of thought um, and decisions made by other people. Uh, Haley, I don't know if I make it look easy, but it's not. Um, but that's OK. As Lisa said, it's a mess. It's a chaotic mess and learning is a chaotic mess. And I think that we can't avoid that. And this is to Catalina's point at the top of the hour. Learning is going to be messy. Um, the Internet is messy. We can't separate the two and create these neat little spaces that have exactly what our students need to know, both because that's impossible and also we don't know what they need to know individually if best for them. They don't know that. It's this time of sifting and winnowing, right? UW Madison. And finding out what works well for me, what works well for the instructors, what works well for the administrative team, and finding out, negotiating in that mess, uh, the things, things, multiple things that can cover most of the bases, still support um, the outlier cases that have more challenges, and figure out a way to make that beautiful, chaotic mess uh, work together. John, did I hear you say that? Are you saying that BB Collab support for BB Collaborate and Zoom will disappear? In I am not saying that, and I have not heard any um, any information about uh, BB Collaborate and or Zoom being dis uh, disconnected okay. and not supported. So, but Teams I would may be become very a, surprised if Zoom uh, went away. But Teams will become a part of integrated into Canvas. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying that if you do a Google search for Canvas and Microsoft Teams and PR, 
uh, press release, you will see two um, statements from the two companies saying that um, they had planned and were going to turn uh, make it their official thing. Now, just because it's Canvas's official thing does not mean that it is. It, it doesn't mean anything. You know, we're using Blackboard Collaborate. Blackboard is a competing uh, learning management system from Canvas, but we're using the Blackboard Collaborate um, as sort of the video conferencing thing. So things play well together. There are some, uh, you know, Canvas has its own version of Kaltura, and we don't use that. Um, I think it's called Spark. I don't remember what it's called, but there are lots of elements of the structure, the company that owns and Canvas, where they say, here are some tools that work well with Canvas, and we don't use those. So what's official for campus and official for Canvas are two different things. I need to say that very strongly. Thank you um, for those of you who came in to help, and for those of you who helped with the activity sheet, it is 2 o'clock. It is after 2 o'clock. Uh, you're all free to go. I'm going to stick around for another uh, 5, 10, 15 minutes. As long as anyone is willing to keep talking to me, we can keep talking about um, ideas and things that we've heard um, or not heard or speculate on. Uh, and I'm, I love doing those conversations too. And I'll be very careful to represent things as accurately as I can. Thanks all. Thank hey, you. feel free to unmute and, and turn your mic on and chat with me. Thanks for coming in, uh, Peter. You know, I appreciate your um, your comments about making messes about stuff because I, you know, actually, you know, although sometimes it's very embarrassing and everything, but other times it takes it it makes perfect teaching opportunities. You know, especially if you can get the point across that what we're trying to do is making learning communities, you know, like whether it's a big class or a small class. And I think, I mean, I, you know, the, the discussion is very good. Um, if you can have buy-in from the students that, you know, to make it socially acceptable to do certain things and to, you know, to convey the standards of what the expectations are and what you want to do. And then, you know, at some point, I think, you know, most of us will figure out kind of like, you know, what the appropriate thing is to come up with. If it's finding your own article or finding your own video example of something or, you know, and I think that's kind of like, um, if you're transparent about what you want to do, I think, you know, they at some point people get that and they they start to respond in kind, you know, so that I mean, that's my and so I can perfectly relate to your making messes and making mistakes and, you know, yeah, it can be, you know, you make it look easy to do teams, but I yeah, I can see like, you know, it's so certain of certain things like that are a pain. And you know, that's the way we live in. <laughs> that's the well, world we live in. So, so much of, of learning is learning how to navigate messes. And, right. you know, in any time that we invite students into it, we're actually increasing the messiness, right? Because we're bringing all of their messiness into it as well. So we could do, you know, two things where we say this is a very structured, highly structured, highly check off the boxes thing and I will lead you dot to dot to dot to dot along a path to get to the end and then you'll see the picture of the duck or I can say let's figure out how to draw a duck together and that's going to be a messy thing but we're going to have a better understanding of what a duck does and doesn't look like yeah. you know possibly um, because we've helped to create that yeah right all right, well, it was a pleasure. Uh, I'll run, so see Very you Very good. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Hazel, are you around? I see you popping in sometimes. Very good. Hope all is well. See you next week.